Now to move on to our next section, um, you may have heard mention in Ellie's speech about a lawsuit that's going on. And one of the ones who've been lead, organizations that have been leading that uh, has been the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. And if you've been in the South, or been in the South a long time, or were born in the South, sometimes that sounds like an oxymoron. Southern Coalition for Social Justice just doesn't always. So I'm going to let Jeremy Collins, uh, who's been working on that project with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, explain that and. Um, why we should be concerned because one of the things Ellie may have mentioned is, you know, if you were born in the South about 1930 or 1940 and didn't have a birth certificate, if you're born at home, then that makes it a lot rougher for you to be able to get voter ID. So I'm going to let uh, Jeremy explain, maybe talk a little bit about the Southern Coalition and also talk about what they're working on with respect to voting rights. Thank you. Good morning. It's a blessing to be here with you all this morning. Uh, I looked on the agenda and it says that this is a panel discussion about who is affected by the voting rights laws. This will be a quick talk, everybody. <laughs> I can see you, I can walk out. Right? <laughs> uh, but I, I, I am, I'm, I'm very blessed to be here and I'm excited that you all are doing this, that we are doing this. I want to use community language. Um, which, which, is, which is a great jumping point um, about the Southern Coalition. I'll say a, a small bit about myself. My name is Jeremy Collins. I'm an uh, Eastern North Carolina boy. I was born in Martin County, a little town called Darden's, um, right outside of Williamston and Plymouth, North Carolina. Uh, my father pastors a church there, uh, pastors two churches there. Any of you know about the, not just the South, but the country? Uh, a country pastor uh, might pastor two different churches and the, and the members go both places and they fellowship together you know every Sunday uh, but that's just the way they, they get down uh, in eastern North Carolina so I, I grew up uh, a person of faith still I am today uh, graciously um, and um, was instilled with this purpose and and uh, commitment to care about other people more than myself and I, I appreciate my, my parents for giving that to me. Been fortunate enough to connect with great people like Bob Hall and Bob Phillips, uh, my good friend, Mr. George Reed and others uh, who've been working tirelessly in North Carolina for decades around social justice and civil rights. Um, before doing this work I was involved in a death penalty, anti-death penalty coalition and um, was fortunate enough to meet up with Anita Earls back in 2007 when we were forming the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. And so uh, I'll, I'll refer to it as SCSJ, but uh, SCSJ was formed in 2007 to be a full service advocacy firm. And what that means is that we employ lawyers, organizers, legislative advocates, social scientists, um, and all disciplines toward advancing a civil rights and social justice agenda. Uh, we are community led in the sense that we want the community, we want to partner with communities to develop a strategy, to develop a plan, and then we want to help folks implement that plan together. No big eyes and little me's, uh, but the idea is that those most directly affected know the solutions that they need, and that if we pull our resources together, that, that we can most uh, efficiently effectuate transformative change, right? Um, so I've been volunteering with that group since 2007 and uh, have been working with them since uh, 2013. I come to you today to talk about who's most directly affected by the voting rights laws and while I said it in jest earlier it is actually true. We all are affected by the voting rights laws in one way or another. And I'll talk about the several lawsuits that SCSJ is involved in, and I'll close uh, with a story about one or two, but m definitely one of our clients. Um, I'm sure since this law has been passed, you've, you've heard it called several different things, whether it be the House bill number or the monster bill or the omnibus bill or you know the boogeyman in the closet bill. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's terrible, and we can't dress that up. This bill was designed to make sure that people that look like me don't have an equal opportunity to participate in our political process. 
This bill was designed to make sure that people who look like you don't have an equal opportunity to participate in our political process. This bill was designed for people who don't think like us to have a leg up in this political process. And that is constitutionally wrong. As Reverend William Barber would say, that is morally wrong, right? And that's what we're here today to fight. Um, I won't get into the details of the bill because I, I know that, that most of you understand it. Um, but I will say this. Senator Kinnair mentioned a, a moment ago about the three different lawsuits that have, com have been combined into, into one uh, federal suit. Um, I, did, I think you did mention that earlier. And, and you know, so there's a, there's a Southern Coalition is engaged in four lawsuits in North Carolina right now. Um, we are challenging the, the North Carolina legislature's redistricting of, Wake County school, of, of the Wake County School Board. Um, we have a North Carolina redistricting argument that's still waiting on a decision from the North Carolina Supreme Court and that we made that oral argument on January 6th. Um, so unprecedented long time in waiting for a decision back from the North Carolina Supreme Court and we believe there are some political implications there. Um, and then we are engaged in two uh, two legal battles as it relates to this bill. And I'll talk about our federal lawsuit first, which challenges essentially the uh, end of same-day voter registration, uh, the shortening of the early voting period, uh, and the requirement, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the shortening of early, early voting period, and uh, the elimination of the counting of provisional ballots, out of precinct provisional ballots. So we are engaged in that litigation, and our we, we have uh, the League of Women Voters and other state clients but then there's also a lawsuit from the, the North Carolina NAACP, which has been joined with our lawsuit, and the United States Department of Justice, which has been joined with our lawsuit. Uh, and most recently, we have learned that we went to, the, went to federal court in Winston-Salem a month or so ago and asked for an injunction. We were denied that decision, uh, but we just found out last week that there will be that, that our appeal will be heard before the Fourth Circuit of Court of Appeals on September 25th, next Thursday, in Charlotte. So in this redistricting litigation, we have this uh, unprecedented lengthy wait for a decision back from the North Carolina Supreme Court. On the flip side, uh, in this federal litigation, we have this unprecedented quick turnaround uh, with the Fourth Circuit saying they are willing to, to hear uh, our arguments on appeal for the injunction, and that injunction would essentially stay the provisions of this, of this law that would go into effect for the November election. So we are hopeful, not everyone is hopeful. That when, uh, when, you, when you do this work, you have to, be, uh, you have to become accustomed to getting your brow beat. Um, but we're gonna go, as I was telling someone earlier, we're gonna go before the court and make an enthusiastic argument uh, because we believe that we are standing on the right side of justice. Uh, we believe that we're standing on the right side of the people. We believe that, that, uh, that it's not just organizing work, that it's not just busy work, that it's actually God's work. That we believe that the, this work is about ministry. Everybody, everybody that works at Southern Coalition might not tell you that, right? But I don't mind saying it because I know that's true. Um, I believe that's what we're all called to do, and I, I believe it's what we're, 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 we, that we should, this is what we should be about. I'll talk a little bit about our state uh, court case where we are challenging the requirement for an ID uh, in the 2016 election. It's a constitutional challenge, but I think that the, the essence of this lawsuit is really our name playing, Ms. our name plaintiff, Miss Alberta Curry. Uh, now a 79 year old woman from Eastern North Carolina, uh, born in Hope Mills born of a midwife and at that time in a home without a birth certificate. And Ms. Curry has voted in every major election since 1954. She moved to Virginia for 20 years and lived there uh, and has a Virginia driver's license. And the way the law works, 
she is ineligible to receive a North Carolina ID because her Virginia driver's license expired literally months before she would have been included and eligible to get a North Carolina ID. This law would completely disenfranchise not only her, but other North Carolinians uh, who are similarly situated. If you talk to Ms. Curry, uh, she will remind you not only about what life was like in North Carolina in 1950, all right? Not only about what it's like to be uh, a, a young African-American woman in the South, but she reminds you about what's important about family. She reminds you about what's important about togetherness. And for her, voting is not just something that you do on the first Tuesday in November. For her, voting is an expression of power. For her, voting is a ticket of togetherness. For Ms. Curry, voting is an acknowledgement by the government that she exists and that she has a voice and, she, and, that, and that she has a responsibility to exercise that voice as often as possible. So she tells stories about the first time that she went to vote and how in that day when African Americans went to vote, if they were in line, if an African American was in line and a Native American person came or a Caucasian American person came, they got to get in front. And essentially African Americans just had to step back and step back and step back until they got to the front. And if people just came to the line to vote and they were still waiting there, they had to wait. So Ms. Curry tells this story about the first time she went in to vote, several people got in line in front of her and, and, and she asked her mom, she said, Mama, why, why are we here if people are just going to jump in front of us and continue to vote uh, and, we, and we keep getting displaced? And her mother looks at her and she says, hush child, that's why we're voting. And she remembers that to this day. She tells that story so poignantly. When I sat down in her living room, I thought I was talking to my own grandmother. That's how, that's how connected I felt uh, with, with Ms. Curry. Her memory's a little fuzzy, uh, but remarkably sharp. And uh, she has two daughters, Brenda and Linda, who try to uh, manage everything she says and, and control what she does. And every once in a while, she has to touch them and say, I know what I'm talking about. I was there. <laughs> so if you can imagine Ms. Curry sitting in her living room telling the story about what it was like to be in line in 1956 um, or telling the story about the journey, the trick that they had to take just to vote, telling the story about working in the big house and taking the day off because it was just that important to go and vote, uh, for her mother and her father to instill in them that no matter what she does that she always votes and then to hear her tell the story about how when she had her own children that she reminds them all the time, primary election, general election, I don't care what you do, you go out and vote because voting is our voice. This law was intended to disenfranchise Ms. Curry. Organizations like mine, not just, not just my organization, folks like Senator Kinnaird, the, the organizations mentioned earlier today, uh, we're going to fight that with all we have. We're going to fight that ignorance. We're going to fight that hatred. We're going to fight that racism. We're going to fight that oppression. Uh, we're going to fight that prejudice with all we've got. Um, we're not going to dress it up. We're not going to make it seem like it's anything other than what it is. A deliberate attempt. Uh, as Senator Kinnaird mentioned a moment ago, uh, we do have to prove intent. Very, very difficult burden to meet. Uh, some of you may have seen on, on television the uh, the young man from Asheville who said, if, you know, well, if this bill disenfranchises some black folks, so what? Um, you might think that's enough. Well, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, you might even think that some emails that we see that where some legislators um, have hinted around uh, knowingly doing this to give a certain party a competitive advantage. You might think that's enough. It's not enough. You might think that uh, a local county chair saying uh, this bill will this bill will no doubt make it easier for us to win school board and, and county commission and, and city council 
uh, races uh, for the foreseeable future. You might think that's enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. I honestly don't know what it will take to convince this current court of what is enough. But I'll tell you this. I know how we're going to get there. It's not just going to be in the court. It's not just going to be because Anita Earls and Eric Holder and the folks from the Advancement Project made some brilliant legal argument before uh, uh, the Fourth Circuit or even the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court. It's not going to be because uh, we beat them on the merits uh, in Wake County uh, Superior Court in this Wake County School Board redistricting litigation which is now uh, in federal court. It's not just going to be because the Supreme Court decided with us in the redistricting litigation where we also have to show that these lines were purposefully drawn to disenfranchise people. Uh, it's not just going to be a battle that we win with crafty legal arguments. We're going to have to organize meetings just like this. Whether it's 10 people, 20 people, 50 people, 100 people, and we're going to have to do it all over the state. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to exercise an interdisciplinary approach to winning this. Uh, we're going to have to not just organize, not just mobilize folks, but we're going to have to pray like we haven't prayed before. We're going to have to exercise our faith in a way that we haven't, in, in an open way, in a way that honors every person who brings their best selves to this conversation. And then at the end of the day, we have to lift as we climb. So as we're praying, as we're working, as we're organizing, as we're giving our best legal arguments, we got to pray for those people who despitefully use us, right? We've got we've to we've lay them down in this situation as well. Because I don't know what their motivations are. It appears as though they, they come from a place, they have mercenary intent. But I don't know that. What I do know is that we will be victorious. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know what argument we're going to have to make. But I know we're going to win because we're on the right side of this thing. And we're winning now. Not just in the courts, but we're winning in organizing. Bob will probably talk later on about Operation Jumpstart that, that community groups are getting involved in. We've got poll monitoring. Uh, at an unprecedented level, we're developing applications to help people capture information and disseminate that information all across the state, not just in North Carolina, but we're working across the South with young people and, and groups of faith and professionals and lawyers and legislative advocates and academics. That's what it's going to take to win. That's what it's going to take to win. It's going to take everything because all of us are affected by this voting law and all of us have skin in the game and all of us are going to have to put our shoulder to the wheel to win this thing. So I appreciate your time. I'll take any questions. Questions? Yeah, I'm going to say, first of all, you can tell Jeremy is the son of a preacher. <laughs> 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 He's an inspirational as well. Um, he, he talked about one thing, and that is the Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court. In the last election, they spent, at first we thought it was $2.4 million to defeat a Democrat. Turns out total was $4 million. Uh, the Supreme Court races are usually things that nobody pays any attention to, and the incumbents just get reelected time and time again. But in... Um, 10, 2010, uh, the big money on the federal level, the Americans for Prosperity, the Koch brothers and, and those uh, organizations realized that if they wanted to win redistricting in order to change the makeup of Congress, hmm. they would uh, try to go after all of the uh, state legislators, legislatures, and that's what they did. And what happened was those state legislatures flipped, and they were able to write redistricting. And when you hear about that, you're going to really be, I think, very shocked. Uh, but the point of all that is then now they're going after the courts. And we know that, and they started last time with that Supreme Court um, campaign in which they spent all that money, and they won. There's another Supreme Court race this time around, and we know the same thing is going to happen. 
the, the court case called Citizens United has utterly corrupted our system by allowing unlimited money to be in these fictional organizations uh, called uh, PACs that are um, social, welfare. social welfare PACs that are supposedly not connected with any candidate, but we know that the people who uh, leave the candidate's campaign and go to work for these people, we know there's coordination. And, and, but, and then they made it worse with a case called McCutcheon, in which the uh, people can now get just enormous amounts. Our system has been utterly corrupted by money, and now they're going after the judicial. And to me, this is striking at the heart of our system when they attack on all these levels with unlimited amounts of money that is just, to me, frightening. I, I'm, I'm sickened by it. But that's what we live with. And there is a Supreme Court, uh, and, and you know, they're nonpartisan. Supposedly. But we know really what they are. And so <laughs> that's word of mouth. There's no way you can find out who these Supreme Court justices are with the usual type of information. It's really word of mouth. But each of the parties will tell you who they're voting for. But again, it's this total corruption of the system by money. There was a question over there. Okay. One thing blocks both when we can. <laughs> Uh, but I wanted to ask a simple little question, and it doesn't apply this time, but uh, what does one need to get a, an identif uh, identification at the Department of Motor Vehicles, and how much does it cost if you're trying to get somebody and they don't have a driver's license or they don't have an ID? How much does that cost? So there, there is a uh, Bob, and, and we can, it should be. Free. There's a there's a there's a mechanism for you to get a no fee ID. We have had challenges at different DMV sites around the state where people have attempted to get this no fee ID, um, and so the, the the answer to your question is there is a mechanism for you to get a free ID. I believe you have to have your birth certificate and you have to have two documents that. Were establish your identity yeah and, and one establishing your residence right and there's a variety of documents you can use what do you do if you and don't you, have a birth certificate you, if you can get it free if you tell them you are either registered to vote or intending to register to right. vote and you will sign a declaration of that without a birth certificate if you well, have now that's a whole those are two separate okay. issues yeah but that if you have the one of uh, one of several documents that can prove your identity it doesn't have to be a birth certificate. So you call DMV to ask what you need? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. But, but what, we, what we're learning, though, is that different DMV sites are handling the provision differently. Right. Uh, so, and, and not only are different DMV sites handling differently uh, with, uh, with an issue that uh, I've been working with, with Democracy North Carolina on, different, you could go to the same DMV office and, and, and two different officers that come to the window are handling it handling it differently. But if, but if Jane Doe does not have a birth certificate, she can get a an ID. She first has to get a free birth certificate. Right. From no. where? But well, I thought you have to pay many her. documents you could use besides a birth certificate. But but they've written in the law now you get it free for this purpose. But there are a lot of documents. If you go on the website, which is a mess, it will give you a huge long list of what thing I think Bob can give me probably the outline there. Well there there is a, a website that's that's there's a website that's dot IDNC dot org, I think. Right. Dot IDNC. Or go on to democracy dash NC. I would go to democracy NC. That's and, what I would. and you'll get it. Um, but there are there is a list, as Ellie says, of, of the options that you have for IDs. And it but it's also the case that how this is being implemented is is really bizarre and arbitrary right and by itself should be enough to throw the whole thing out you know right is it democracy nc dot democracy dash or hyphen nc dot org right so you thought you had you thought you had an easy question and it was not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes sir i'm concerned about the poll watch 
think it's 10. Ten in the entire county, not right. ten at one place. Right. Yeah, they can yeah. go from precinct. They can go from place to place. And you should be concerned about that. I mean, I think that we have to be watching out for our rights and the rights of our peers in that process. You're getting to be a good politician because Ruth asked you how much it would cost, and you never said anything. Can you give us a good estimate or guesstimate? Uh, I, I haven't been to, to the DMV to get a new license, so what is, does a new license cost, and is that what the cost is? I'm sorry. I thought I, thought I did answer and say that, you, that it's free. It's free. It's free. It's if you tell them you're registered to vote, right. I'm oh, to. Okay. Yeah. I, I, but suppose, suppose I go in and I tell them that I want to have an ID, and they say, we are not going to give you a free one. You're going to have to pay for it. What would the pay be? I, I think that if you just want a state ID, yeah. I, I want to say the cost for that is around ten or fifteen dollars. Yeah, ten. Ten dollars or so. But you can get it free. But you can get it. But you can get it free. If you are registered to vote, or tell them you're intending to register to vote, you sign a declaration. I'm not a politician. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for it. Yes, ma'am. No problem. Any other questions?